Welcome, everyone. Uh, like Maybe we can close the back door so it's quiet in here. Uh, so this session is about maps, like Wikipedia and maps integration, and Mikkel is an OpenStreetMap. Mikkel is a, like, he's on the board of the OpenStreetMap Foundation and is a, is a part of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and, and his initiative, Ground Truth, Truth Initiative, has a, he's like done work in Kenya, um, Kibera, um and various other, um, Palestine, uh, like some amazing like mapping projects, and he's going to tell you about them. So like if someone in the back could, like, if it gets loud, close the door, people can still come sneak in, but sure. all right. Cool. Thanks, Katie. Uh, thanks. It's, uh, it's great to be here. This is uh, my second Wikimania. I was at Alexandria 2008 and had the pleasure of holding, I think, the first mapping party ever in Egypt, including the use of GPS units. Um, which at the time was illegal, um, so that was quite a thrill, and I think it was only possible by the goodwill which was created by having Wikimedia in um, you know, Wikimania uh, happening at that moment. So I am uh, Mikkel Marin. I'm. Uh, and it's not working. Okay. All right. Twenty minutes. I'm going to try to cover a lot of things. Uh, I was going to focus maybe just on the work that the kind of work I do in places like Kibera and India and Jerusalem. But um, to calibrate my talk, I'll just ask you, how many of you have heard of OpenStreetMap? Okay, how many of you have edited OpenStreetMap? Wow, okay, how many of you are members of the OpenStreetMap Foundation? Wow, okay, <laughs> wow. It's only 10 British pounds, it's really, so maybe I'll convince you by the end of this. So I'm gonna talk generally about OpenStreetMap. I thought it'd be interesting also to compare, well, just a little bit high-level comparison between the communities of OpenStreetMap and, and Wikipedia. Um, then talk about OpenStreetMap and marginalized communities, which is more or less what is advertised uh, for this talk. And finally, talk a little bit about how, how OpenStreetMap and governments interact. It's a lot. I'm going to talk very fast. Um, if you have any questions, just uh, shout them out. I'm happy to um, explain something in more detail. OpenStreetMap. Uh, free and open map of the entire world. Uh, yes, we've often called ourselves the Wikipedia of maps. Uh, we started in 2004. Our goal is to create a map of the entire world, not just streets, any kind of vector data. Anyone can contribute, anyone can use the data, and um, uh, we, that's what we do. Uh, we collect data in lots of different ways. Uh, prim we started off primarily collecting data with GPS units, and this was even uh, prior to smartphones. We started in 2004, so Garmin GPS units, walking every single street in a, in a city, collecting points of interest, writing things down, on um, clipboards like that. That's my bicycle. That's Brighton, England. I biked around with that. That was the geekiest thing I've ever done in my life, was attaching a <laughs> clipboard to my handlebars. And um, what you do is you go out and you collect that data. You come back to your computer. You get the data off of the device. You use one of the editors. And you edit data. You upload it to OpenStreetMap. It's, it's a, a database sitting in a closet in one of the college, uh, colleges in London. Numbers, yes. Uh, over 600,000 registered users, 3 billion uh, GPS track points, uh, 1.5 billion nodes and ways, which are kind of the primary data objects in, in OpenStreetMap. Editors per month, 20,000, uh, which is a lot, but also could be a lot more. And um, foundation members, around 300. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of our sort of like our, our circles of participation. Um, probably the core of the community is in the thousands. One of the biggest moments for OpenStreetMap was the Haiti earthquake. It was sort of, I know, Wikipedia, there was uh, this guy who was accused of killing Kennedy, and that was like a big moment where everyone had heard about Wikipedia. Um, for us, uh, it was Haiti, and we uh, had for many years advocating open data for use in disaster response. Um, it is a, this is a, an area where organizations traditionally haven't shared data, lots of data silos, um, yet, Anytime there's a disaster, they go and they collect a bunch of data, and then maybe they give it to the government afterwards, and it just disappears. This was this happened in um, uh, events like the Indonesian tsunami. Haiti, uh, we tried to do things differently. Uh, hundreds of people um, used imagery, which was freshly acquired, and created a uh, free and open database of, of uh, Port-au-Prince and the rest of Haiti in a matter of weeks. It was the most comprehensive map of Haiti that was ever uh, created. It was available to anyone. 
And because it was openly available, it's still available to anyone, and we've made a lot of effort to contribute to creating an ongoing community. Um, in disaster response, there's often a sharp divide between the immediate relief and the ongoing reconstruction of, of a place. Um, when you have data that's available throughout that process, then you can do some pretty amazing things. Uh, we've uh, had a campaign this year called Switch to OSM. Um, some other mapping uh, APIs out there have uh, lately been doing things like charging, charging money for, their, uh, for usage or um, uh, adding advertisements. And so there's been increased, uh, there's been traditionally a lot of interest in humanitarian fields and among hackers and, and even governments. Companies are taking really serious interest now. Um, OpenStreetMap is meant to distribute data for use anywhere, including commercial companies. It's perfectly great. So Foursquare uh, is switched to OSM Nestoria, uh, with real estate website. Even Apple um, is using OpenStreetMap in some form or another, though we, uh, you know, exactly how they're using it is still kind of a question. So I was, I was in the last session in this room, which was very interesting to hear about the, the uh, challenges that face the Wikipedia community. Um, there's a lot of similarities uh, with the Wikipedia of maps, as we call ourselves. Um, but there's, there are substantial differences. I think it starts with the fact that OpenStreetMap is a database. Um, we're uh, not trying to create textual uh, articles. We're actually trying to um, populate a database with data. And so from the start, all of the tools reflect that. Um, and it means that for instance, uh, all translation happens in a single database. We don't really have distinct versions of OpenStreetMap for different countries because generally all of the geometries and geographies are the same wherever you are. The thing that, that differs, of course, are the names. And so you can um, translate within, uh, within the database and localize, which people do. But then there's also a default name, which, you know, is there a default name for anything in the world? Well, the only place that it shows up is on the main OpenStreetMap website. Um, which uh, many people find like, uh, very enjoyable to, to uh, edit back and forth. So the source of our edit wars are not really so much about geographic reality. And in fact, they're very, very small, but there's a, there's a number of places in the world, which, which I think you can guess where they are, where <laughs> disputes happen. This is, uh, this is actually in um, Jerusalem. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is a village called Alalaje, which is actually completely uh, surrounded by the, the security barrier. And um, the kind of edit war we've had in Jerusalem is the name of Jerusalem has gone back and forth between Hebrew, Hebrew and Arabic. Um, and the name of, of, of the city in Arabic is Al-Quds, which is, means the peaceful. It's a different name to English. And it's gone back and forth so much that event, it, at this point, there's actually no name of Jerusalem because no, we couldn't get to a point where everyone would agree. Uh, we have something called the on the ground rule, which ultimately uh, we use to judge how to, how to sort of solve these kind of disputes. Um, but in this case, there's really no on the ground rule because it's still a, an area which is of, uh, yeah, it's still up in the air as far as everyone can tell. So that's, but there's only a few places where this, where this actually happens. We do have quite a lot of imports. I, I, re I realize that Wikipedia um, also does have bots and things, but because so much geographic data has al already exists, governments collect it, companies collect it. Um, all of the U.S. was originally uh, started with an import of tiger data, which is collected by the United States Census. Um, there's lots of different opinions about how, uh, you know, the worth of importing data into OpenStreetMap, but there are certain things like political boundaries or widespread database of land cover, or forest cover, that really make a lot of sense to import, and that presents a lot of challenges to uh, the community because you want human beings to actually ultimately be the ones who are uh, maintaining the database as well as uh, it's a technical challenge. Um, synchronizing multiple databases and conflating geographic databases is sort of one of the hardest problems right now in, in GIS and this kind of science. We're, uh, we're not a destination site. That's uh, OpenStreetMap.org is not supposed to be the site where millions and millions of people come and get their maps. Um, it's, it's a place where mappers and users of map data can um, edit, can uh, relate to other people in the community, can test out what the, the actual rendering there, the intention is not to make a useful map, but to show what the data looks like so that mappers can improve it. 
The idea is that the data can be distributed and picked up by others, whether they're organizations, companies, and they can do interesting things with OpenStreetMap data. And around that, we have quite a complicated and, and robust software ecosystem. The core of OpenStreetMap is a Rail, Ruby on Rails application. There's a, there's a RESTful API. We do dumps of the entire database every day or every week and have updates uh, published every minute. And there are all sorts of bits of software which will take this, build databases elsewhere, visualize that data, make uh, routing applications, mobile applications. We're, um, for better or for worse, we don't have much uh, process or rules. Um, we probably could use a few more. Um, it's, it's, uh, new users are generally treated with a bit of uh, uh, gently, actually. Um, but when you get more and more involved, it becomes more and more contentious. So maybe that's the way it should be, but we certainly could have a, a bit more um, <coughs> just clear understanding of what it takes to get involved in OpenStreetMap. It's still, I think the learning curve is extremely high. Just pushing the edit button is, is, going, is not going to um, really help. Uh, on the plus side, or I don't know, we don't have much just random vandalism. Perhaps it's just not fun anymore. Or perhaps it's just like our tools are too hard, which is, <laughs> which is a problem, actually. But it has a, be has a benefit. We have a foundation. Um, I'm on the board of the foundation. Uh, we have new employees. Uh, we have a budget of around $100,000 per year because we don't have a massive server infrastructure. Um, the role of the foundation is more supporting the project than, than like directing it. But uh, in my opinion, this is also, uh, we should be able to absorb more money and do more things. So we're still, uh, I, I was talking to, to Eric earlier, it's maybe like we're, we're at the stage that Wikimedia was at in 2004. And we've actually been there for a few years and we should probably get a move on. Um, Yes, we have local chapters and national chapters, but, but geographic boundaries are a lot more fluid. It's not like, you know, every, because you don't have one single you know, national site that everyone's working on, the notion of, what, of where communities gather is, is much more blurry and misunder I don't, not well understood. Okay. Any questions? Shout them out if you have them. Yes. Go ahead and shout. Sure. Sure. The educational open Esri, Esri is a, a proprietary software company, which is basically the biggest GIS company in the world. We're, we don't produce software, we produce data. Um, Esri actually has started to cooperate with OpenStreetMap. They have a plugin for their tools, which allows you to directly edit OpenStreetMap. It's a little, it's kind of interesting because they come from a very different culture of like, of geographic data as authority. And so it'll be interesting to see as more people who come from the Esri world, which is the, tr the paleogeographer world, I mean, more the neogeographer world, mm -hmm. what happens when we meet. But we're certainly not in competition with them. We're, we're co we cooperate with them. And now, yes, and, they, and, the, and one of the big, big companies in neogeography, which is called Geocommons, was just acquired by, by Esri. So people like Andrew Turner and Sean Gorman are now, jacked. they've been jacked, yes. <laughs> there, yes. Yeah. No, that, but that would be awesome. I mean, that's uh, maybe we might hear a bit. We're going to hear a bit more about um, that kind of work happening in, in Wikimedia, and hopefully we can piggyback on that in some way or another. Yes? Do you include uh, topographic data anywhere? No. No, it's uh, like it, only f uh, features. Yeah, not topographic. So I've done a lot of work in marginalized places, which are in places sort of off, off the map. Uh, map Kibera. Kibera is a, a large slum in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, in 2009, uh, we decided to go and do this crazy thing of teaching people from Kibera, young people generally, who are very smart but who haven't had a lot of uh, opportunities educationally or career wise to make maps of the place that they live. Um, they did so in about a month and um, did a great job. We worked with local community based organizations and selected young people based off of where they lived within Kibera, which is sort of divided into smaller villages. Um, and they, they took the job. The, um, Kibera uh, was a blank spot on the map. This is what it looks like on official government maps to this day. Um, despite you know, hundreds of thousands of people living there, um, 
it doesn't exist, and that's kind of a, a problem for um, a government which is supposed to be serving its citizens. Officially a forest, yes, in some, in some cases. This is a uh, Kibera according to Kibera. Uh, thousands of points of interest, all collected by people from Kibera. Churches, mosques, uh, clinics, uh, pharmacies, uh, schools, everything you could imagine in any other community is in Kibera, only more so. And um, it's quite a dense and complicated map to, to uh, collect, so quite an achievement for them. Um, a lot of people have become interested in Map Kibera after seeing this work. I often wonder why, what exactly they're interested in. Obviously, it's a compelling story, but I'm always not. Sh I'm not sure if they always get all of the aspects of what it takes to do pull off something like this. Um, and uh, I think part of the part of it really has been, uh, yeah, technology is is a really fantastic trick. You have these guys from Kibera who are editing the very same database as any of us would be editing, and they're able to to connect. Perhaps there's a similar. I don't know if there's been a similar dynamic in, in Wikipedia, but it's been pretty phenomenal to have that kind of neutral place that the map creates. And these guys are the ones that are the best experts on the place they live. No one, no matter you know, how, their title in the government or how much training they've had, are going to, is going to do a better job than these guys are at collecting data in a place like Kibera uh, because well, it's slippery and a little dangerous. This is a huge change um, uh, for uh, hundreds of years, maps, data are used by the state in order to provide legibility to their domain, to, to collect taxes, to fend off enemies. That was the purpose of creating maps, ultimately. And just within the last 10 years, this technology has been opened up to literally anyone. And I don't think we yet know the ramifications for the way we organize ourselves as a society when this very, very core technology to how the state functions actually is now in the hands of just about anyone. And a place like Kibera can be on the map. Um, another reason why I think Map Kibera is interesting is because I think our expectations are quite low. You don't think that very, very poor people could who have very little education could possibly do this. Um, this is Kibera, it's a, the Kibera River, it's quite polluted. And um, I mean, just to think about it, UN Habitat, which is based in Nairobi, uh, it's a UN agency which is responsible for slums globally, estimates there'll be two billion people living in informal settlements by 2030. And so we better start having higher expectations and hoping that places like this can do this kind of work, otherwise we're going to be in quite a uh, load of trouble. We also don't focus just on data in our work, there's a strong citizen journalism component, because if you, if you over focus on data, you, citizen, you know, citizens as sensors, is sort of instrumentalizing what is very actually like a very human uh, place and a human process and not very empowering ultimately. Uh, a lot of organizations are interested in getting data about places, but what does that actually do for allowing a community to, to grow and change? So we do storytelling. This is Kibera News Network. They do video. Um, we've thought a lot about how participatory technologies, like OpenStreetMap, like Wikipedia, meshes with, with what's called participatory development. This is a methodology which is uh, decades old, which actually engages people in communities like this to, to um, draw up their own wishes for how they see they want development to happen. And even though they still have, both have that name participatory in them, um, they're very different in practice. For instance, participatory technology, like any technology, is very fast. But one of the central tenets of participatory development is that you have to develop a long-term trusted relationship with a community in order to make change. Otherwise, um, if you're there and then you're gone, and yes, you have data on, on the map, it doesn't make real change in that community. One place where we start to see um, uh, the sort of the grassroots data collection and government data collection uh, come, come together in interesting ways is around the Kenyan census. In 2009, uh, Kenya conducted a census of the entire country, including Kibera. They announced in 2010 that Kibera, which for years had been known as a place with one million people, um, then Jill Biden, who is the vice first lady, visited uh, Kibera. Suddenly, it was 1.5 million on the White House web, uh, blog. Um, there's lots of reasons why that number's been inflated. Uh, a lot of it sounds really impressive, but if you've ever visited Kibera and s like had a sense of like how many people one million people is, it's really it's impossible if you if you're walking around. But the the government came up with a figure of 170,700, substantially lower. 
that was shocking for a lot of people, including me, because I knew of two other studies which had done with, with known methodologies, which had come up at di with different figures. One collected population in a subset of Kibera, door-to-door -door surveys, and then extrapolated to the entire area. Another analyzed um, satellite imagery, derived all of the structures, and based off an average density per structure, they both came up with a figure of around 250,000. I know the methodology. I don't know the methodology exactly for how the Kenyan census was uh, conducted. And I know from experience that collecting data in a slum is extremely difficult. And I know people who weren't counted. And so here's an example where uh, open data that's created by a community and government data suddenly um, creates a different dynamic. This is an interesting uh, educational example. This is a class, a high school class in Luxembourg, uh, which has done a netbook class this uh, this past semester, and they their instructor taught them how to use open source uh, GIS tools. They downloaded all of the open data from from uh, the Map Cabrera website. They studied in uh, our documents, our reports, the videos, and they put together all of these maps. And so there's actually a collaboration between young people in Luxembourg, of all places, and Kibera. Um, and it's pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, everything's in French, so I have no idea what it says. But the curriculum that he developed is going to be made into English. And what I'm hoping is that uh, classrooms in Kenya can take advantage of this. How am I doing on time? Um, let's see. So I, I always advocate for open data and community processes. There's lots of interest in this kind of work, and there's not always a full appreciation of the central things you need to do in order to, to I think, do it right. Uh, this is one example um, from Haiti. Uh, about two years after, after uh, uh, the earthquake, the data's still there. The mappers are still there. And this is a map of the TapTaps, which is an informal bus system which runs in Port-au-Prince. Um, they collected all of the routes. It's not formalized. There's not like it's mainly run by syndicates, it's, and there's no central authority. But they've made a map of those routes and made that city just a little bit more understandable. Okay. And so finally, I'll close with a, a quick peek at how OpenStreetMap relates to government. And um, governments are increasingly adopting open data policies and getting on the open data bandwagon. The easiest way is uh, if a government releases open geographic data under a pro under license which is compatible with OpenStreetMap's license, um, then uh, it can flow one way. We can do an import, and we've done that many, many times, including Tiger, including uh, lots of coastlines, French land cover. But it doesn't need to stop there. Uh, recently, the uh, an agency in South Africa released their data for import into OpenStreetMap, and they went one step further and said, not only can you use it, but we know that you really care about the data that you collect. We know that you do a very good job, and we know that our database um, is not perfect. And this is a government agency admitting that they don't have perfect data. It's quite unique. So they're setting up processes where they'll listen to the changes which are coming in from the community collected data. Um, Surrey Heath is a um, borough council in, in England, and they manage all of their geospatial data directly in OpenStreetMap. Um, they're part of the community directly. Um, they monitor change through, you know, through RSS feeds. And if anyone else edits, they know who the, they know those editors, or they check them out. They they feel an ownership over that place. Obviously, it doesn't mean they're the only one that's contributing data, but they they manage it very closely. And of course, you can just simply use um, OpenStreetMap. And there's lots of examples of this, including the White House makes website and other government websites make use of. OpenStreetMap is the base map and just to layer stuff on top, like this is an inventory of, of disused government buildings that they're, they're trying to sell off um, right on the White House website. Um, this is a, Tandale is a slum in Dar es Salaam, um, and this is a collaboration actually with World, World Bank and um, Ground Truth, which is my firm. We worked in an informal settlement there, similar to Map Kibera. They They mapped everything. Um, in cooperation with a local university, in cooperation with a local administration, um, which is very different from Kenya, where there's not that sort of uh, space for cooperation, and um, started doing reporting. And finally, the way that we <laughs> that we uh, uh, engage with governments is through sometimes through disputes. Uh, there's a very very tiny island between uh, Korea and uh, Japan, uh, 
which is sometimes called different things depending on where you're from. The Koreans call it Dokdo Island. You can't even see it at this Zoom level. No, one person lives there with his wife. And um, this is a long-standing dispute, and the Korean uh, ambassador of geographic names is actually interested in now, and how do we manage this sort of process? And so this is going to get quite interesting. And North Korea, um, yeah, I mean, we don't have any direct contact with North Korea yet. North Korea didn't actually even, you know, go for this because South Korea is taking over, in care of that, that, that pet virus. So North Korea didn't really, you know, shout over it. Yeah, no, North Korea has no problem with Dokdo. Um, they have problem with, they, they, they have a problem with the rest of South Korea, I guess. Exactly. Um, but it's Japan, it's Japan which, which also has, there's conflicting um, claims. In North Korea. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we actually have maps in North so Korea. Have have we can map, yeah, I mean, there are places, say, Google Map Maker, which is a commercial uh, product that looks a lot like OpenStreetMap in a lot of ways, except you can't use the data. Um, also allows, restricts where you can edit. So places like North Korea or like Israel, you can't actually edit Google Maps. Um, yeah, closing thoughts. Be gentle, because uh, you know when I'm sure Wikipedia is aware of this. When the spotlight comes, it really can distort a community. And I, whenever I talk to governments or talk to organizations like the World Bank, I say let's try to understand each other and take it slow. But there's really sometimes um, things things just have a momentum of their own. So we but we do have to be be gentle, um, especially in international development. There's a big uh, sort of People aren't, aren't really ready to, to share all their dirty uh, laundry. There's a lot of uh, happy stories about how everything is working out great, and we need to be a lot better at sharing the challenges, which I, which I do um, too much. Um, there's a lot of, uh, we have to get smarter about data licensing. Um, the for OpenStreetMap, which has now is finally moving, really moving, I'm, I swear it's moving to the Open Database License. Um, if you can actually take data and make uh, make a cake and sell that cake and people can eat it, then that, after reading a data license, if that's something you're sure you can do, then your data license gives you um, complete freedom. Um, I hate the word crowdsourcing, so um, I think it gives it, I, I don't know how the Wikipedia com uh, community thinks about it, but I think it, it really distorts what's actually going on. It gives this image of like a wild, unruly crowd when actually we're very, very intricate and interwoven communities that have relationships both online and offline, and that kind of trust is actually what makes com this community work that you don't get in a crowd, and I think it's actually a term which we continually have to say, well, yes, because anyone can edit, Why? but how do you stop the mad, you know, and well, that's because we're not like this. We're actually uh, much more structured than traditional organizations. And ultimately, I think all of this, uh, Wikipedia and OpenStreetMap, does represent a fundamental power shift in that people who are living in places now have the tools and have the ability to change their life on, th on their own um, without in holding to account governments and service providers to really um, do their duty. Um, I think that's ultimately where I hope this kind of technology, OpenStreetMap and, and Wikipedia, can take us. Uh, there's a mapping party on Sunday, which um, I think is happening at the Congressional Cemetery. I'm sure Katie will tell us about it, but uh, I, if you haven't done OpenStreetMap before, or you have, I encourage you to, to uh, check it out. It'll be fun. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> should, should we do questions at the end? I yeah. Think? OK. I'll, I'll just take one while you're setting up. Can you repeat the question? Open cycle map, the top topographic. Open cycle map takes, uh, yeah, so open cycle map creates tiles that uh, combine both open street map data and a separate topographic database okay. in, in just the process of creating those tiles. And but there are sources of it, yes, of a, vari a varying um, resolution. Um, 
yeah, they build tools which make use of OpenStreetMap data, for instance, the OpenStrip Planner, um, which was first developed with the city of Portland, I think, um, has made use of OpenStreetMap data. So because we're, we use the, you know, open standards, open file formats, then that's how there's a relation. And also there's been some work in um, a disaster risk reduction, um, which, which OpenGeo has gotten involved in, uh, which makes use of OpenStreetMap data in, in Indonesia. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. My name is, my username is Colossus, and the real name is uh, Tim. And I want to give an overview about the cooperation between OpenStreetMap and Wikipedia. And after all three talks, we will have more time for discussions, but we will make it in a neighbor room. So far, we will change the room to 3.8, 3.08. Um, the cooperation with OpenStreetMap so far. Um, it starts uh, through 2009, and so we get a tool uh, server in the tool server cluster, and then we are started to experiment with OpenStreetMap data and yeah, bring some tools and some map applications to life. But uh, at the beginning of my talk, I want to um, uh, tell you <coughs> why we are handling uh, map data and what we are doing in Wikipedia and why we are doing this. And so what are in articles? We, are uh, we have um, objects like cities or buildings or rivers. And all of these uh, geographical objects have relations uh, uh, and informations that are best shown on, on maps. <coughs> and so we have some uh, maps that are in the article and are created by hand and are um, sometimes a little bit older. The left one is from the 17th century public domain, and the other things are created by uh, users and are um, created in the maps workshop so far. And that's the way we are using maps at the beginning. And is it a new idea to use uh, maps in an, in an encyclopedia? And I would say no. This is an <coughs> old, old Brockhaus. Also, if the name is the Neue Brockhaus, the new Brockhaus. <laughs> and you can see here that are, in com that are five books, and one of them is full of maps. So <coughs> a lot of information, let's say 20%, are Geo, uh, geo information and how we are doing uh, this. So I started in uh, German Wikipedia 2005 to collecting uh, geo coordinates and collecting them and extract them to uh, a database and create uh, different tools of that and so on. And what we have now is uh, we have in the right corner on, on the top of each article with a coordinate, we have uh, some links there. And in the middle, you have the, the coordinates. And this uh, brings you to the tool called Geohack. And that's a linking page to uh, different map services like Google Maps and so on. So you ha can draw choose what you want. And on the left side, you have such a little globe that is the Wiki Mini Atlas. You will hear more about that in the next talk. And on the right side, you have in uh, many language versions, expected uh, English version, you have something like a map. And that brings you to a tool called OSM Gadget. And that includes uh, OpenStreetMap directly into uh, the Wikipedia article and have some special features. I will tell you more later about that. Yeah. And we have also, besides this internal usage, we have also some uh, external use cases for uh, geo coordinates. So we were the first people that had a Wikipedia layer inside Google Earth and Google Maps. It needs a while until Google Maps or Google makes the same. 
And we have also free pro projects um, that using the coordinates inside Wikipedia. And this is, for instance, a KDE Marble, a GNOME, um, um, a Globe uh, application from uh, Linux desktop. And other things are ap um, applications on uh, our apps on uh, Android and so on. Um, so that your your smartphone tells you what you what you are seeing. Okay. And here's a map that is completely generated out of uh, Wikipedia coordinates. So you can see the density of uh, the Wikipedia coordinates, and each dot is really an uh, edit by a Wikipedia user and created. So, and that's quite interesting. And you can also see the development of that. Uh, it started 2005, and now we have nearly two million coordinates, different coordinates. So I'm collecting uh, the coordinates over um, uh, uh, 42 uh, language versions of Wikipedia in the moment and merge them together, and that's the result of that. And so I want to come now to uh, the cooperation and what parts are inside it or elements of the cooperation. This is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a special version of GeoHack, then uh, the OSM gadget, more in the detail version. Then we um, have different styles. So we use the, the server on the tool server cluster to give uh, people account there and they can experiment with the data. We, we have a up-to-date uh, database from uh, OpenStreetMap, and the people can create different styles, different tools, tools to improve the quality and so on. And then at the last uh, two uh, special uh, projects where we can bring also something back or can connect more the data of both projects. So this is multilingual maps. Uh, as mentioned before, there are some uh, in the talk before, you see the, the problems if uh, OpenStreetMap only exists in one language version and we want to uh, change this. And the other thing is we wasn't, I will tell you later this. Okay, at the beginning uh, is the um, GeoHack for OpenStreetMap. It was at the beginning, we, we already had the, the geohack, and so it was a low-hanging low fruit for us to bring, the, um, make also such a special page for linking uh, for all kinds of OpenStreetMap uh, websites and maps. And that's um, a little bit of a problem in OpenStreetMap that um, it's more a de decentralized system and the foundation of OSM want to be as small as possible. And so you have a lot of websites with different services and different ideas. But on the other side, this um, concept to be very small <coughs> and have external uh, developers is that it is really uh, uh, fast to develop uh, new features and so on, faster than in the Wikipedia perhaps. Um, okay. That's the site, and it's linked in the normal geohack, and so you can take a look uh, what OpenStreetMap already has uh, on features. Now more to the OSM uh, geohack, that's included in the in the Russian, in the French, and German Wikipedia, and lots of other Wikipedias, and also easy to in, um, install in uh, in other language versions. Um, it shows an, you an OpenStreetMap map, and on top of them there are um, Wikipedia articles. Y you can click on it and come to um, these other articles there. And yeah, and it has uh, some hidden features. Perhaps uh, if you click on uh, options uh, in the left corner. You can change the language, so this influence uh, which Wikipedia uh, links you see. You can also try to uh, uh, see each uh, article as a little thumbnail. It's a little bit funny feature, 
but perhaps a little bit not so useful. And on the right side, you have um, different layers and different options to change the map. Uh, so that is the map that you want that's useful for, for you. And so you can act, um, change the base layers to let's say to the hike and bike map. It's more if you are going in the nature and uh, go hiking and so it's better to use this. Or you can use uh, the public transport map to know um, how you can come to one place uh, with the bus or the tram. Yeah, and then you have uh, different overlays and there you have, uh, you can reduce a little bit the complexity so you can deactivate some layers like the Wikipedia voice if you want to look especially to the OpenStreetMap. And you can also activate the hill shading. That's one thing that we also render on the tool server. Yeah. And what makes um, the usage and who use um, the map so far or the inclusion? And in summary, you can we can say we have mm, nearly 10% of the usage of openstreetmap.org so far. And so we get uh, 250 tiles per second in the uh, daytime. Yeah, and then um, the next topic is that we have, uh, beside of that um, map or this OSM gadget that we have in production, we have also some uh, styles there on tool server and we render them in real time and this is the hike and bike map you can also activate this map in uh, open in um, the osm gadget and you can see also the the hill shading and that would i would say it looks really beautiful so far and another map is going more a um, little bit political direction it shows you surveillance cameras, and so you know where Big Brother is watching you. <laughs> Another political map on Tool Server is a smoking map. This was a topic, in especially in German, in Germany, um, and so you can see the, the red circles are there um, pubs and restaurants where smoking is allowed, and in the green area you have better air in the, in the <laughs> room so far. It's better for you. Okay. And that's a very important project. We are starting with this and it's called it uh, multilingual maps. We already have this running on a, on a pool server, but we cannot uh, really promote this in the, pro in the moment. Um, the problem is uh, we need one server nearly to render one style and now we want to would say, okay, let's render uh, 200 languages or 285 languages. And we would need a lot of more um, yeah, hardware and so on. And that's why, or, yeah, or let me tell you, the, no, I will jump over to two slides. Uh, we will, um, change something in the rendering process, but that's in the moment in the talk a little bit too technical and um, the um, project al already is in the starting uh, and in the concept phase. Um, but if you have questions or ideas to, uh, to this, um, please come and discuss with me. So it means, yeah. And I will go back uh, two slides because I want to show you the problem in OpenStreetMap. We want to use uh, OpenStreetMap also like a tourist guy and so. That are the usual, uh, usual use cases that somebody want to travel from Europe to, to Asia and so on. And then he comes to a map like the, the right one and, so, and understand nothing. And we also want to use uh, this uh, map in, in schools and so on. It should be an alternative to, to learn something. And so it would be better to ha have a translation there for the names or a script that you can read. Okay. And now let's come to my, r to the last project. 
I did with somebody together. And the name of the project is Vivosen. And it's now to the Wikimania, I activated this in all language versions that support uh, um, the OSM gadget. So please test it and ask me if it's not running. And the idea behind that is it's um, before we already, we only <coughs> collecting geo coordinates. So we only connect a point or a fingertip on the map, there is uh, the object. But we don't collecting uh, information about the structure of the object or how large an object is and so on. And now we are able to use uh, OpenStreetMap. And OpenStreetMap is so flexible that we can use their uh, also integrate uh, Wikipedia text. We can add a uh, Wikipedia text to the OpenStreetMap database. And we have on tools of a, a copy of the OpenStreetMap database there. So we can extract this information back. And on the next slide, there is a little bit the concept behind that. We have the map integrated in the, in the, in the article. And that's And this gives the, the name and the language of the article to the Vivosen database that's in the middle. And we fill this database with, um, with the Wikipedia text. And a little bit more complicated because uh, OpenStreetMap has another object um, system to use nodes, weights, and relations. And we must transform this to a geometrical objects like points, lines, and, and areas. But we do this, and we add uh, we use also the um, Wikipedia interwiki links. So you n need only to add um, one Wikipedia tag for each object. And one important thing is that you use it in, in this way. So you must add the language to the of the article, else it's not possible for us to to match. Uh, both versions. And the Vivosen database is not really um, uh, a database. We use the file system for that. So we have compressed uh, GeoJSON uh, files there on the, on the server, and we can uh, very easily uh, deliver them to the, to the browser. And for the uh, interwiki links, we use a system of soft, li of soft links in the file system, so it's really fast and can handle a lot of requests. So we give uh, vector objects back and that works very well in nearly all browsers but not in Internet Explorer <laughs> so far. It's, it works but uh, in some cases uh, the browser died. And so <laughs> I activate the funct functionality for this browser in the moment but we, we work on this and have some ideas to solved that. And the other thing is, is, this? is uh, the second uh, future project uh, to add uh, um, additional data sources. So we're handling some historical data or some very unsharp uh, data information. And for that, uh, we want to have a solution uh, to support this. OK. That's Vivosen, and I I really want to invite you to um, uh, um, to bring more Wikipedia tags uh, to OpenStreetMap. Um, the reason is uh, we have now in the OpenStreetMap database, let's say, 170,000 uh, Wikipedia tags. That's a lot, but. Uh, we have two million Wikipedia coordinates. And so we um, must fill the gap a little bit. And But it's easy to do. And to do this, we created also, you can do this by hand at the Wikipedia text, but perhaps it's easier to use some uh, tools. And for that, we created uh, two tools. One of them is add text tool. It combines the CAT scan on, you see it on the left side of the screen, screen, and it combines it with a query of OpenStreetMap data. 
and then it tries to, m to match both data and in the next step, y so you have a, um, a table with the matching with all objects and in the next step it's going to the OpenStreetMap editor, mm -hmm. Jordan, and it select uh, matched objects, you can prove it and then you can uh, add uh, the Wikipedia tag automatically, you must only say click uh, add tags. And one special feature is that we use in this case also the interwiki links and so you can also bring the um, translations to um, OpenStreetMap. That's uh, then again good for multilingual maps. And the second tool is a plugin. So if you look in uh, JOSM, look after uh, looking after plugins, and then see the Wikipedia plugin and try it. It brings you a list of objects, and you can try it. Yeah. Okay. Then I will come to my yeah to my end of the talk of this talk and what we want to do in the future. Um, we want to make it uh, well established. That means uh, it would be nice to integrate the OSM gadget to the English Wikipedia. And the other thing is to make it more well known. Um, I, tr I see a lot of people and talk with them and they, they use uh, the Wikipedia a lot, but they see the link to the co uh, beside the coordinates or the coordinates uh, never seen before but we have it uh, since 2005. Um, so it would be nice to talk with them and give them the, the hint that there is something interesting there. Um, then the next step is uh, if uh, Wikidata is already done, we uh, should uh, move the data, the coordinates to a central place to Wikidata um, before it makes not really sense to uh, invest a lot of power to uh, change now the templates and uh, bring additional parameters to there. It's not so, not so easy. Okay, the next points are things that would be nice, support in, uh, for lists, uh, also articles with a, with a lot of uh, geocoded uh, objects, uh, support Satellite images is a little problem for uh, with a good resolution and so also top uh, topo maps is a problem so it would be nice to see a mountain range and so there's no really a good support in OpenStreetMap in the moment and then the next step would be uh, perhaps uh, to make a complete cleanup it's a little bit full the map and so it would be nice to create a OSM integration. Uh, 2.0 and <coughs> and yeah the last point is um, we have a um, Wikipedia map shop uh, workshop and in a lot of uh, Wikipedia versions but there are the people working really with um, manually or with different tools or tools like In Inkscape that are not so perfect and it would be nice uh, to use tools from OpenStreetMap like Time Editor to bring it to life. And the last point is uh, we are also waiting for your ideas. It's a completely volunteer project. We have hardware some support for the from the foundation, but the rest is coming from volunteers. Okay, then let's say thank you. And so Thanks for sticking around. Um, I'm going to talk about Wikimini Atlas, uh, which has been my pet project for the past seven years, I think. Uh, it's been already mentioned in the last talk, uh, and you've already gotten the whole spiel about the coordinates in an article. I'll just uh, show you this little introduction. I don't know uh, how many people of you have noticed this blue globe or uh, let alone clicked on it. If you do, 
uh, it owns the Wikimedia Atlas and um, it shows you, uh, uh, first of all, the Vivozen uh, uh, derived data from OpenStreetMap. You have a little three-dimensional globe that uh, gives you an uh, orientation hint uh, as to where you are. Uh, you get textual labels, uh, which are extracted from Wikipedia, uh, showing you all the Wikipedia articles uh, that are in, uh, uh, in the region you're looking at. You can zoom in, you have uh, uh, the rich data from OpenStreetMap. I've dumbed it down a little, so all textual information from OpenStreetMap uh, is omitted. Uh, textual information uh, is uh, only presented in the form of pickable labels. You can switch the overlay on and off, you can uh, zoom out. Uh, the labels are, uh, uh, should be updated uh, uh, immediately when you're, when you're dragging the map, so there's no need to wait for the labels to reload. Uh, you can see that the, the little globe uh, actually rotates uh, along while you're dragging the map. Okay, uh, what else? Yeah, here we go. And you can zoom back to uh, the article where you started in the map. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, my stats are not as impressive. I only get uh, like 13 tiles, uh, so 13 tiles per second. So that's like a, a million tiles per day. So I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, the technical background. So essentially, Wikimedia Atlas is uh, a piece of JavaScript that resides on Wikipedia uh, that is run every time you open uh, a Wikipedia uh, article page. Uh, that script has access to, uh, to the built-in variables of MediaWiki, for example, the page title. Uh, it has uh, access to any Wikipedia page. It can use your browser to load other pages uh, and analyze the data. Uh, and it has access to the page DOM, which are all the HTML elements. So its, its main job is essentially to search uh, for coordinate links in the Wikipedia article uh, and to insert the little blue globe and uh, the iframe that's uh, to display the map. And the iframe is a script that uh, resides on the tool server. Uh, it's only loaded when the user actually clicks on the blue globe uh, to minimize the overhead. Uh, uh, it, its job is to display the map, to load the tiles, to load the labels, to load thumbnails, to load uh, overlays. Uh, and it, has, uh, it communicates with the Wikimedia tool server where uh, my uh, tile set is generated uh, where the labels uh, that are to be displayed on the map are generated in surf uh, and uh, it pulls the uh, OSM objects uh, that Tim mentioned uh, in, in his talk. And there's a bit of communication uh, going around between different servers uh, that's Ajax, so it's HTTP GET uh, essentially and between the page script and the frame script uh, I'm using a post message which is uh, uh, across the main communication uh, between uh, two different uh, uh, domains. So uh, I'm uh, basically implementing a slippy map, uh, which we all know from OpenStreetMap, from Google Maps. Uh, so it's, uh, it looks like an infinite map. You can scroll all over the world at all the zoom levels. Uh, it only uses a finite number of tiles, and this is how it looks behind the, the scenes. You have a gutter zone. Whenever a tile leaves uh, on the left side, it gets reused on the, on the right side with a new uh, image and new set of labels uh, stuck on it. And uh, in the current version, the tile is just a simple div element. Uh, it has a background image. The background image is the, uh, is the actual piece of map. Uh, and the div element holds a bunch of links. Uh, holds a bunch of links, which are the clickable links uh, to Wikipedia articles. The development version, uh, which I'm currently working on, works a bit differently. Uh, the map element is uh, um, uh, displayed using an image element, and that allows me to bind on load and on error uh, events, which I'll uh, talk about uh, a little later. So uh, how are we getting the, the label data? Whenever a new tile comes into the view when you're scrolling the map, uh, I'm first looking into session storage. Session storage is a, uh, is a local database in your browser where you can store a fair amount of data. Um, so uh, many times when you zoom out and zoom back in, uh, the label data will be cached and will be immediately displayed. This, uh, that, that's faster than even the, uh, the browser uh, uh, cache. Otherwise, um, uh, a script on the tool server is uh, contacted using an, again, Ajax request. Uh, it, uh, uh, it 
ask the database what labels are uh, on that particular tile. Uh, it returns a piece of uh, JSON, which is this, uh, like, uh, this is an actual example, the scripting thing. Uh, and um, the data is uh, sent back to the frame, is cached in session storage and um, displayed. And we can look at one particular label. So this, this tile contains, I believe, four, four labels on total. So you have a style, that's the little icon next to the, uh, to the textual label. Uh, we have uh, events, uh, we have uh, cities that have uh, dots of different sizes and the regular, or the, the <coughs> most often used uh, icon is just a tiny little arrow pointing to the, uh, the location of the label. Uh, then we have the language, then we have the uh, Wikipedia page, Alexandria, Virginia in this case. Here we have the coordinates in pixels within the tile so that the label can be accurately positioned. And then we have the, uh, the actual text of the label that is to be displayed. And that doesn't have to be uh, the name of the Wikipedia page. For example, Alexandria, Virginia, if we're looking at the map, we know usually that we're looking at Virginia. We don't need to see Virginia uh, on every uh, single location label. So this is filtered out uh, to streamline uh, the data. And this is some secret stuff. So uh, textual labels allow you to browse Wikipedia uh, visually without having to click on icons every time you want to find out what something means. Uh, if you want to get even more meaning, uh, there's a feature by pressing Control and hovering a link, uh, you get a little summary of, uh, of the article that you're um, pointing at. That's the so-called synopsis uh, feature. So, yeah, it's magic. Uh, so how does it work behind the scenes? Uh, I'm not writing those summaries. Uh, Wikipedia does an incredibly good job at uh, summarizing the essentials of, uh, of an article page in the first paragraph. Uh, so I have a script on the tool server, uh, which uh, essentially uh, maintains a database of summaries. Uh, and uh, there are currently uh, over 60,000 summaries cached, so that I don't have to regenerate them all the time. Uh, this is again an AJAX request. I'm sending the page title and the language code uh, to the tool server. It looks into the database. If a cached summary exists, it's sent back and displayed. Uh, if it doesn't exist, the tool server fetches the Wikipedia article, um, uses an XML parser to parse it and fetch uh, the first paragraph the first real paragraph, avoiding things like templates, info boxes, so there's some black magic uh, going on. Uh, and this new synopsis is then cached in the database so that you don't have to do the work all the time and have a responsive um, interface. Uh, and on the frame, uh, some things are done, uh, like the, the links are made protocol relative uh, and absolute, uh, and the link target is set so that the new page doesn't open within the Wikimini Atlas, but uh, on the outside. So and this is uh, just an example uh, summary, and you can click all the links and usually get a, a fairly good idea. And there's been, uh, I, I've spent some quite some work to make sure that uh, the whole thing also works with the right to left languages uh, such as uh, Persian, Arabic, Hebrew. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now what else can we visualize? Uh, if we have an article with a lot of coordinates, like for example, list of volcanoes in the United States, uh, each coordinate from that article gets displayed as a blue dot in the Wikimini Atlas. Uh, we can hover the dots and uh, uh, get, the, get the titles of that are associated with the, the coordinates. You can scroll around. Yes, that is still the United States. That's Guam. We uh, can zoom in a bit. Again, hover one of those dots. Aha, uh, uh -huh, interesting. Now we can click one of the dots and boom, the page scrolls uh, exactly to the location of that coordinate. If we hover the dots, you can actually see that they get highlighted uh, in the page text. That's again uh, a, con a communication between this iframe and the page uh, back and forth using uh, message passing of, that's an HTML5 uh, feature. We can have complex embedded geodata. Uh, you've heard about the connection uh, Wikipedia uh, and OpenStreetMap. This is um, something uh, beyond or besides that. Um, we can have, we have in the English Wikipedia a couple of articles that contain uh, this template, KML file. KML, Keyhole Markup Language, uh, is a, an XML-based language describing uh, geographical data. Uh, we can embed this geographical data into uh, Wikipedia articles. Wikimedia Atlas fetches this data and visualizes it on the map. Uh, and uh, current browsers, current computers can handle insane amounts of data. So this is a 
very high, fairly high fidelity uh, polygon that is rendered in real time on the client side. So nothing is pre-rendered here. This is Navajo Nation, uh, New Mexico, Utah, uh, Arizona, and you can see many, many little sub-polygons. You can handle holes in polygons and so on and so forth. Uh, so yeah, just uh, having uh, being the sole maintainer <laughs> gives me a bit of flexibility. So this attached KML mm -hmm. template was created February 4th. Uh, Wikimedia Atlas supports and visualizes uh, the data since February 7th, so uh, three days later, and we currently have uh, 800 occurrences. Uh, and uh, it gives us the opportunity to insert uh, geodata that's uh, out of the scope of OpenStreetMap, such as uh, habitats of species uh, or diffusely defined uh, regions like here the Mojave uh, Desert that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, correspond to an OpenStreetMap uh, object. Uh, using now this uh, this here is uh, data uh, pulled from Vivosm. Uh, so you, you for the user it doesn't matter whether it's attached KML or Vivosm. You get the data that the editor wants you uh, to see uh, on the map. Uh, this is the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, that's that's nice. It's somewhere in Africa. You can see it's actually highlighted also on this uh, 3D globe. But how big is that country actually? Do you have an idea? Maps always distort. So let's compare it to something that we know. We can select uh, to overlay, uh, <laughs> overlay something we know, Texas, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty big, yeah, okay. So uh, now we can do it the other way around. In the size comparison overlay, you always have the current article as one option as well. So you can uh, take the Democratic Republic of Congo drag it around on the map and see how it compares to, I should have dragged it to Europe, I dragged it. Greenland. Greenland, yeah, let's go Greenland. And you can see it's reprojected, <laughs> it's reprojected in real time, so uh, that, the <laughs> that the map, is, who was that? Yeah. Uh, that the map projection, um, the distortion is actually compensated for, and you get a real sense for, uh, for how big that thing is. So it's done in JavaScript. It's insanely fast. Like a couple of years ago, nobody would have thought that you can do that in a browser. So getting overlay data, uh, I, I showed you two, three different kinds of uh, overlay. Uh, first of all, when you, when you do page load, the page script that's embedded in the article, uh, essentially, or served together with the article is executed. Um, it uh, scans the article and uh, looks if it finds any coordinates. If it finds at least one coordinate, uh, then it inserts the iframe and, uh, and the little blue uh, globe. Uh, all the coordinates that are found on the page are compiled into a list and then coded as a JSON string. That's just a text, uh, text format to contain arbitrarily complex data. Uh, also, the script is looking for this attached KML template, it looks for it in the DOM, it doesn't retrieve the article text, so there's no extra network traffic at this point. Uh, only when the when the user actually opens the Wikimedia Atlas, clicks on the blue icon, uh, the uh, the frame script uh, will send the title uh, of the current page uh, to the tool server, uh, and we, we're looking whether one of these uh, Wikipedia OSM uh, objects does exist. If it exists, it returns the geo uh, geo GeoJSON, Jesus Christ, on <laughs> data uh, that's, um, that's prepared by Tim and his, uh, his co-worker. Uh, the, the, the data is reprojected uh, to, to fit my map projection, which is Latlon, Flat Carré, uh, very primitive, I know. Uh, and then uh, displayed using a canvas uh, element that's overlaid over the Wikimini Atlas. And then the frame triggers the page script, uh, again using this uh, post message uh, mechanism. And now, uh, if the uh, page script previously found the attached KML template, uh, it loads <coughs> the sub page, parses the KML using the browser's built in uh, XML parser. It's lightning fast, there's virtually, you virtually don't feel a, a delay. Uh, it compiles um, the, uh, the data into uh, a JSON format and uses post message to, pe uh, to uh, push it back into the frame where, it, uh, where everything then is uh, displayed on the map. So uh, we have uh, Landsat imagery in Wikimedia Atlas. OSM is nice, but sometimes you wanna see um, uh, how the world really looks. Actually, Landsat is a very bad description of the world. 
how it really looks, but uh, it, it gives you uh, some idea. For example, here's a flood plain in Africa. Here are the pyramids near Cairo. Again, you have the, the labels here. You can see the 3D globe is now textured with the Landsat um, images. So how do you switch between the vector and raster? Oh, you can, uh, there's a settings thing here. I'll probably have to work big time on the UI, but uh, <laughs> that's all right. Here you can actually see a Vivosan uh, overlay. That's the Mississippi River, this Mississippi, Mississippi Delta here. Uh, there's uh, Salt Lake in uh, Bolivia, popular tourist <coughs> destination, a uh, beautiful lake in Australia, who knows what it is. Capital of Tibet in the Himalayas, so you get some idea of uh, how mountains look like. And of course, vehicle assembly building. Resolution is only 15 meters, but it, it, it gives you some idea of uh, the layout. For example, here, a uh, shuttle uh, launch complex uh, not being used anymore, I guess, sadly. So how, how am I uh, serving and rendering tiles? Um, I'm using um, OpenStreetMap data. Okay, so what, what happens if the, uh, if the frame uh, requests a new tile? It sends the coordinates uh, to the tool server, to the HTTP server. And this looks like a request for a static image. It's a URL containing the tile set, the zoom level, uh, and the uh, coordinates of the tile. If the tile image uh, exists in the folder, it's returned uh, and displayed uh, by the frame. If it doesn't exist, uh, then uh, the 404 error is trapped using the error document directive and uh, the request is rerouted to a PHP script. The PHP script uh, communicates to a render daemon. That's a process that's continuously running and waiting for instructions on the tool server. It uses a named pipe communicate with that uh, daemon and it just adds a request onto the request stack of the render daemon and uh, whenever the daemon gets to it, uh, it renders it. Uh, so the render daemon uh, uses Mapnix connected to the OpenStreetMap database uh, or it gets data from NASA JPL, uh, the, the satellite data. I have to rescale it, recut it so that it fits into my tile uh, schema. Uh, and I'm also sharpening the data a bit so it looks uh, somewhat more awesome. What is the render daemon written uh, C plus or, yeah. Uh, so the tile is generated and put into the static uh, file folder. Now two things can happen. Either this, the, the PHP script uh, waits, just doesn't answer, uh, which is kind of a bad thing, right? So I don't do that for more than 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Uh, and it pulls a couple of times. Usually uh, that's long enough for the uh, render daemon to, to generate the tile. Uh, otherwise, I'm sending a, a 302 status back, which causes the client to reload uh, and retry. And then uh, the, uh, this PHP script will re recheck whether the tile is there. That's the old way. The new way is way cooler. Uh, I'm uh, immediately returning an error to the frame. I'm trapping the error event. Uh, and I'm setting a timeout handler to try again to fetch the tile in a few seconds, right? So I don't have to uh, have any blocking or waiting uh, server processes. What percentage of the in the oh, that's a good question, which I cannot possibly answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bob. No, it's probably way. It's probably way less. Uh, I've. I've I've pre-rendered a lot. I'm not re-rendering the map very often. Uh, last time I re-rendered major portions was when I actually started using OpenStreetMap data to render the tiles, and that was uh, a couple of months ago. Okay, so I'm uh, supporting uh, plenty of, of languages. Uh, I think in theory it's, uh, it's 50 or so. So we have, of course, English, uh, Deutsch, German, uh, Francais, uh, Ruski, Russian, uh, that's Arabic. Uh, so I sat, I sat down with a user, oh no, hold on, Arabic, Hebrew, uh, Korean, so you see Unicode support uh, allows for labels going uh, up and down, uh, Japanese, uh, Malay, they don't have that many coordinates, unfortunately, beautiful script. Uh, uh, Farsi or Persian. I sat down with a user from the Persian Wikipedia this morning. I don't know if he's in the room. Uh, no, unfortunately not. And uh, he helped me sort out a few more uh, right to left issues. So if you know Persian, there might be some errors here because I haven't, uh, those are old pictures, but this, this now looks awesome if you're uh, uh, Persian. 
and I can uh, display uh, thumbnails from uh, Wikimedia Commons. So you, you see those little uh, uh, arrows uh, whenever a heading is specified, a camera heading uh, that's, that's displayed on, on the map as well. Uh, and Wikimedia Commons, okay, we can open the, the mini atlas. Uh, for example, I was recently in, in this uh, region here uh, on vacation and uh, just browsing the, uh, the Commons layer gives you an idea where uh, beautiful spots are. In, in the Wikimedia Atlas, you can click on the thumbnails and you get a, uh, get a preview so that you don't have to uh, leave and go back and forth. You can see some thumbnails are small, some are big. The small ones get penalized for having a, a resolution before below 4 megapixels, I think. Uh, that, that actually also uh, <laughs> works on, uh, on the moon. So this, uh, <laughs> this is a lunar map, and there are actually pictures uh, taken on the moon, if you still remember, like uh, 40... 40 years ago, uh, and uh, so if you add lunar coordinates uh, to those, uh, where are we? You can get the landing sites of the uh, Apollo missions uh, here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The number of images with the coordinates, lunar coordinates is very low, yeah. Okay, within the, less than 100 or something. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think I coded them all. <laughs> so you, 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 you can click them, and if you. Yeah, <laughs> if you click, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 I, I strap onto my belt. <laughs> okay, and so if you click the, uh, if you click uh, in the Wikimedia Atlas, get the title of the image, you, you go, uh, you, you're redirected to the comments page. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> so uh, quick, quick uh, uh, rundown, how, how, how am I deciding what labels to display at what zoom level? Uh, so that you need some important uh, sorting. Um, there's a simple scheme. Every tile contains up to four labels, uh, and that means one label per quadrant of the tile, even if that's not absolutely clear from this. One of those labels will have the highest score, uh, and, if you're, uh, and the score uh, for Wikipedia articles is based on article length, so we can dis discuss this in... In until infinity, yeah? <laughs> I just made that up, and uh, <laughs> for now that's how it is. Towns uh, get extra points um, uh, according to their population. When you're specifying a coordinate template, you can, uh, in the type, uh, you specify it as a city, and you can add the, the population that gets extracted as well. Uh, coordinates that are not primary article coordinates uh, currently get uh, penalized uh, uh, big time because they only need to lead to a subsection of the article and not to the main thing. For comments, uh, I calculate the, the base score um, by taking the image size in megapixels multiplied by four, completely arbitrary. Uh, images below four megapixels uh, are displayed at half the size. And then there's a bunch of bonus points. If, you, if the pe uh, picture is featured, it gets 100 points. Quality image, 50 points. VI, oh no, somebody will be pissed. Uh, 30 points. Picture of the day, 20 points. 10 extra points if uh, the user specified a heading so that I can uh, show a little arrow next to the icon. So when I'm zooming out, I'm, that I'm essentially combining uh, uh, four adjacent tiles in this, uh, in this block. And uh, from each tile um, in this two by two patch, I'm taking the most important label uh, and, and throw the other ones out. Uh, and well, then I have my new tile. And again, in this tile, I will have one most important label, and that's th you'll repeat that uh, up to zoom level uh, zero. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, too much time to talk about the database uh, uh, scheme that I'm using to store uh, the labels. Uh, all I can say, I changed it a couple of months ago. It's now uh, flexible, allows support of many languages, as I've uh, shown, and support of uh, many globes. So I've, I've already given away a bit of punchline showing you the moon. Uh, there is a wiki mini atlas for Mars coordinates. So Olympus Mons takes you uh, to this mini atlas. is the biggest mountain in our solar system. The, the little globe, of course, is uh, textured like Mars. There is a surprising amount of, uh, of uh, Wikipedia article labels uh, on, on Mars, and uh, they even tag correctly with uh, as mountains, uh, no cities though. <laughs> uh, Wikimini Atlas uh, Moon, we've just seen that uh, uh, a short while ago, yeah. 
that's beautiful. It's, uh, uh, it uses, um, it's color coded according to elevation. I stole the data from the USGS. It's public domain, don't worry. Uh, we can, um, there's a second moon map, uh, which is uh, sort of true color, well, not much color, but yeah, well. Yeah. Oh gosh, I can't stop this. No, I can't. Can you ask me the question? Uh, wait. Okay, so there's, um, uh, there's a radar map uh, of Venus, so which uh, allows you to visualize uh, uh, Venus-related uh, 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 locations. There is a Wiki Mini Atlas uh, Mercury, which uh, shows you, that's mostly craters and stuff, messenger spacecraft imagery, uh, again, quite a, quite a few labels, I think. I'm uh, so, so those are all labels that are not visualized by any other uh, uh, mapping system uh, currently. And uh, the <laughs> my favorite, that's Io, uh, it's the moon of, um, uh, of the planet Jupiter. And this has even more labels. I don't know who, who codes, uh, who geocodes this, but there's a whole bunch <laughs> of labels. And I got the little Io rotating here while you're, uh, I think, yeah. And this goes to a bunch of uh, Wikipedia articles. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So uh, you can see there's a scale bar here uh, that, that adapts, that already adapts correctly to the radius of, uh, of, the, uh, of the object I'm looking at. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, like probably one or two lines of map. Uh, I, I haven't gotten to that yet, but I, I have that in mind. So like overlaying Rhode Island onto the moon or something like that, that, that will happen uh, uh, fairly, fairly soon. That's, that's essentially trivial. The data is, uh, is there. And, and you? Uh, I was uh, on the <coughs> small female map. Yeah. Uh, how do you determine the sea level? For moon? Yeah. Oh, I don't do that. That, uh, that the USGS does that. Oh, okay. I don't know, even know. They probably don't call it sea level. Mare level, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, there's nothing. Good. Okay, so um, displaying textual maps has uh, some challenges, and one, one of the biggest problems still is uh, map label overlap. You can not, uh, at least not seriously, pre, uh, um, pre arrange the labels on the server because you don't exactly know how the browser will display it, whether, uh, what choice of uh, font it'll make, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm currently working on uh, client side uh, label layouting. And so I have this, uh, this proof of concept. This is just a, a, random, a randomly uh, cluttered uh, uh, labels. And I uh, figured out um, an iterative algorithm. I can go to step number one. Uh, this already looks much better. And you can iterate that a few more times. Actually, it's, it's already done. Let's, let's try this again. Uh, oh yeah, this looks terrible. Can we fix this? Uh, looks like we can. Okay, so um, this this is written in JavaScript and will run on the client side. Uh, the JavaScript knows uh, the size of all these labels. Uh, it uh, actually does a little bit more. It uh, um, tries to make them as compact as possible by inserting the, uh, the line breaks at the appropriate uh, locations. Um, but this still takes um, uh, like a few hundredth of a second uh, to perform the optimization. And when you're dragging the map, and adding new labels, it'll always make your map stutter. And that's not desirable. So what I'm working on uh, are HTML5 web workers, which is essentially multi-threaded uh, JavaScript, which will perform the label layouting in the background, and then uh, send the updated label, label positions back. Uh, yeah, and with that, I, uh, I would like to close my talk. Uh, you can contact me, user on on many projects, uh, mo mostly on commons actually. There's a Jira uh, bug tracker project on the tool server for bug reports and uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, user Dispensa uh, handles the extraction of coordinate data. This I, I used to do that myself. Everybody used to do it himself. Now we have a centralized uh, uh, guy and he does a fabulous job uh, of uh, keeping up to date uh, geodata. Uh, OpenStreetMap, I uh, can't thank them enough for uh, the amazing uh, data they provide, uh, which, which goes into the base map. And of course, user Colossus and uh, his co-worker, Mr. Wagner, for their data extraction with their Vivosum projects. 
And there's actually a whole bunch of people uh, supplying translations. I haven't shown this uh, off, but the, the user interface of Wikimedia Atlas uh, is fully localized, well, fully as, as much as, <laughs> uh, as I've got data. But uh, yeah, if you open it on the Persian Wikipedia, you, you see everything in, in, in squiggly writing. Um, and uh, so this, this worked uh, amazingly well. People just kept coming and added uh, translations over translation, and those are uh, the, the contributors of the translation wiki page. It's on, on comments. Yeah, thanks, and uh, thanks for yeah. listening. And, uh